things that we're offering here at Silverleaf. Sorry, one sec. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, um, let us pray before we start. Lord, thank you that we can spend some time this afternoon looking at another very important aspect of health. And I pray that you'd be our leader and our guide. You are the author of our minds and our brains and our bodies. And I pray that you'd help us to make the best choices and use the information that's provided. We pray in your name. Amen. So who's here for the first time to one of these talks? Uh, welcome. Welcome. So what we're trying to do, um, these are just a few reminders for, for what's gone before. Health, rather than being the goal of life, is a vital resource for such. Okay, so health is not what we aim for in life. Health is what we need to do with life with. Uh, health includes mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, and social aspects. So health is a comprehensive composite of things. And we need to ask ourselves, a, a useful question to ask ourselves is if we look at what comprises health, um, nutritional health, mental health, emotional health, how are we doing in terms of the new start principles, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance. If we make a wheel of those factors, how would our wheel look if each of those is a spoke on that wheel? So sometimes we're very good at nutrition, but sometimes we, in fact, most of the time, we are terrible at exercise. Is that true? Yeah, so for a wheel to turn, it needs all the spokes to have the same radius. Otherwise, it's going to be like this, and it's not going to turn. So a challenge to yourself is, what does your health wheel look like? And we talk in general terms before we dive into today's subject. So we, that last point is so important. Health is a vital resource that we need to show up in the world and to be the best versions of ourselves. And when our health is not, not in where it should be, we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people, especially our mental and emotional health. This is key. And so my challenge and my encouragement to each of us is to say, listen, look, let's look at our health wheels. Let's look at where we need to improve so that the wheel can turn. And the point is for us to influence for God, which is ultimately what it's about. We need optimal mental, emotional, and spiritual and physical health. So God's plan for us is, to, is complete wholeness. I find that encouraging. If you look at the stories in the Bible, they're full of stories where Jesus healed. And he didn't give someone 50% health back. If you look at the story of Lazarus, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Ellen White says in the book Desire of Ages that he was completely whole. He was in a full vigor of manhood. God wants to heal you and I completely. Sometimes that healing will not be complete in this lifetime because of the damaging effects of sin. But there's a lot of things that we can do to optimize the health that we do have. And we've got to say, what resources have I been given? How do I, how do I maximize the, God that, the hand that I've been given? That's the question we need to ask. Um, so our health is like a bank account. All of us know that if you constantly go to your bank account and you withdraw the whole time, what's going to happen? You don't have to be an accountant to know that. It's called bankruptcy. And it's the same with your health. You've got to think, listen, how many health investments have I made today? Sometimes we get so busy in life that we constantly withdrawing without realizing that we're not putting in. And there are very definite things one has to put into your health bank account to keep it in a positive balance. So today I want to ask you, how's the balance looking in your health bank account this morning or this afternoon? Um, we need to learn the rules that govern our constitution. So the other, the other last point is very important as well. Sometimes we're very stubborn. We say, I like this. I want this. I want to do it this way. And we fight the rules of our constitution. You say, oh, I don't need sleep. I don't need to go to bed before midnight. I can get by. Listen, I feel fine on three hours. I promise you, the science is saying you will pay the price. And we're going to look at, look at sleep today. But um, the general principle I'm making is that let's not be stubborn. Let's be smart and learn the rules and work in harmony with the rules. And the reality is that science is now unpacking those rules to a great degree. We're understanding what is required for health, that environment of health, on a far greater, greater degree. So the health of the mind, this is just recap before we go into today's subject, is a direct consequence of the health of the brain. This is an important concept, um, which in turn is a byproduct of a healthy body. And this is emphasizing what we call the brain, 
the body-brain-mind connection. The three are inextricably linked. You can't affect the health of the body, positively or negatively, without affecting the health of the brain, which in turn affects the health of the mind. The mind is built up on the physical structure of the brain, which is built up on the physical structure of what's coming through from the body. And all your organ systems are trying to create an environment that creates an optimal environment for brain function, which is then expressing itself as mental health. So what does a good brain require? A good brain requires healthy gut and digestion. If you're trying to fix your brain and your gut is messed up, you're in trouble. Your gut will always be hamstringing you with um, inflammation and toxins if your gut is not in balance. Anti these are broad principles. Anti-inflammatory state. Inflammation is toxic to the brain. The brain hates chronic inflammation. And we're living in a pandemic of chronic inflammation. Most people that you meet today are chronically inflamed. We're not supposed to have our inflammatory system pushed, pushed on all the time. And that state destroys your tissues and it destroys your brain. So you need intact barriers, uh, a gut barrier and a blood-brain barrier. The brain needs a non-toxic environment. You all see the effects of toxins, drugs, and alcohol on the brain. Um, but it's not just that. It's toxins in food. It's toxins in our water supply. It's toxins that we put on our bodies. Cosmetics, um, deodorants, sprays. These things are all things that constitute part of a toxic load. And we need to carefully choose how we use them and whether or not we're not putting more toxins in than we're getting out. Structural integrity, so the brain needs is a physical structure. It's made up largely of fat. So 60% of the dry weight of the brain is fat. Again, this is just a recap for those that haven't been to the previous lectures, just to touch base. Nutrient density, the brain has a very high requirement for lots of nutrients. So it needs a fuel supply. It needs a steady fuel supply. If your brain's fuel supply is erratic, your brain function will be erratic. And that's a separate talk that we've done as well. Um, a robust capacity to generate ATP or energy. So a cell that can't make energy is a cell that's in trouble. And there's been a lot of science now, scientific research into understanding the mitochondria. We've touched on mitochondrial health. That if you want to be energetic and vibrant and alive, you want to have mitochondria that are functioning optimally. And we're understanding now the science of mitochondrial optimization and the things that actually help our mitochondria regenerate and function better. Healthy stimulation. If I do all the right things and I sit in my room and look at the floor, I'm not going to have a healthy brain. I need healthy stimulation. Those two words together, healthy stimulation. You can have very unhealthy stimulation. So repeatedly using cocaine is a type of stimulation, but it's an unhealthy stimulation. I'm pushing a receptor of the dopamine system to try and get a particular feeling and reward, but I'm doing so at a cost. So healthy stimulation. Exercise. Exercise fundamentally affects pretty much every part of your health and your physiology. And like we're going to look at today, ex um, sleep as well. And the last one is what we're touching on today. Deep restorative sleep and the capacity to clean and regenerate. These are the kind of things your brain needs. Look at this list and tick off. These are things that you can say, listen, where can I improve on this list? Um, and today we're going to look at this one. I thought this was a cute picture. And uh, we want to sleep like that. Lovely picture. The body's, so the guy that's doing the most work on sleep in the world um, that I know of is a guy called Matt Walker. He's a, I think he's based at um, Oxford or one of those universities. And uh, all he does is study sleep. He's a neuroscientist. So his whole life is about studying sleep. Why we sleep, what happens if we don't sleep, how to optimize sleep. And I want to put to you today if you don't prioritize sleep, you're going to accelerate aging, you're going to increase your risk of cancer, you're going to live a very unhappy, unhealthy life. Sleep is your superpower, and you need to understand that you need it and how to optimize getting the best quality sleep. So he says the body's best effort at immortality, that's Matt Walker, and he's an atheist, so he doesn't, yeah, this is not from a religious point of view, but you must hear the things he says about sleep. Um, so, why do we sleep? This is what we're going to look at today. What is required for a good night's sleep? And things that destroy the quality of your sleep. And what to do about them. Those are three things I'd like to try and address today. Just, just as a disclaimer, this topic is so vast. 
and it's a rabbit hole. If you start researching sleep, I started what I thought was going to be a quick talk, and I just went down so many rabbit holes, and this topic is a rabbit hole. But there are some key principles that are so powerful that we can apply to hopefully give us a better night's sleep tonight. Um, so we want to feel like that. I love those pictures. I love it when a picture encapsulates so much, and that picture does. We want to feel like that, but often I feel like this. And sleep quality has a lot to do with that. A saying, I've come to really enjoy sayings and idioms, and uh, you must have heard this one. There's three types of people in the world. You heard this one? Those that make things happen, those that watch it happen, and those that wonder what happened. <laughs> and by the end of the week, if you don't sleep and you look like that, you're going to wonder what happened. You're not going to be someone who makes it happen, and you don't want to be someone that watches it happen. So sleep. Never get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. Anybody guilty of that? Sleep has got so many important functions. Anybody in this room that's not busy in their life, in their week, between Sabbaths? Being overly busy, like we've said before, is actually not an accolade. We wear it like a badge of honor. Oh, I can't come because I'm so busy. You know, I can't do this because I'm so busy. And busyness is a, a trap. And we need to, there's a certain level of work we need to do. And then there's a certain place we must draw the line. Um, and sometimes we have to say no when everything tells us that saying no is to our disadvantage. Um, but this is an important principle. There's another saying I like. Let her sleep for when she wakes she will shake the world. Who said that? Anybody know? It was Napoleon. It's actually there. <laughs> But Napoleon said it about which country? He wasn't talking about a lady. He was talking about China in this context. But I like the quote because actually it has merit in the topic that we're talking about this, this afternoon. Someone else also said this, <laughs> which I thought was funny. But um, I didn't say that. Someone said that. But if we don't get enough sleep, we can be very grumpy. And it's not just ladies. It's guys as well. Something's wrong with our world. This is caffeine consumption between 1990 and 2011. And that was 2011. We're now in 2023. And so the trajectory is up. Those of you that work in a commercial or a normal work environment, how many people amongst whom you start work with don't start with a cup of coffee in the morning? I'm not going to ask who in the room starts with a cup of coffee in the morning. And I want to tell you, that the extent to which we need caffeine is a real indicator of what's going on in your schedule and in your health. If you need caffeine to kickstart your brain, we're going to see the system that caffeine works on. If I need caffeine to function, there's something wrong. Um, fatigue is not a caffeine deficiency. Um, and the whole world is functioning on caffeine. Our department where I work doesn't start without that big fancy new coffee machine that we've just bought starting up. I, when I work in the, walk in the department in the morning, I just hear the steamer going. People are starting to fire up their day, you know. And um, that's an indicator of the kind of pandemic we're facing. We were not designed to require a stimulant to make our brains work. Here's an important saying as well. Sleep is a great barometer of health. The quality of your sleep tells you how healthy your brain is. But if your brain is not healthy, you won't sleep well either. So they work hand in hand. Sleep is a great barometer of health. A healthy brain sleeps very well. A brain that's out of balance doesn't sleep very well. And we're going to see why that's the case. Men, this will make you think. Men who sleep for four to five hours have a level of testosterone of a man 10 years their senior. Think about that. And it causes sleep deprivation causes similar impairments in women as well and generally brain and body impairments as a whole. So the association of testosterone levels with overall sleep quality, sleep architecture, and sleep disordered breathing. Low testosterone, poor sleep lowers your testosterone, men and women. And a low testosterone lowers your sleep quality. And one of the reasons elderly men can't sleep is because their testosterones are often low. 
Um, so men with lower testosterone levels had lower sleep efficiency with increased nocturnal awakenings and less time in slow wave sleep. Now slow wave sleep is the prize, the first prize. If you want to optimize your sleep quality, you want to be getting to slow wave sleep and alternating it well between REM sleep and non-REM sleep. We're going to look at that. So men with lower testosterone levels had lower sleep efficiency with increased nocturnal awakenings and less time in slow wave sleep, as well as a higher apnea hypopnea index. So that's an AHI index of obstructive sleep apnea. And we're going to look at OSA as well. That's another sleep disruptor. With uh, more sleep spent with oxygen saturation levels below 90%. Okay, so we get the point there. Low testosterone levels are associated with less healthy sleep in older men. This was a study. And why is that? So the more fat one carries, men, the more you convert your testosterone to estrogen. The more fat you carry, the higher the activity of an enzyme called aromatase. So aromatase converts testosterone to estrogen in men and women. And the more fat you carry, the higher the aromatase activity. So when you carry extra weight as a man, you convert more of your testosterone to estrogen, which is why men look up, end up looking like they need a bra. <laughs> and they, you know, they start to look like ladies because they start to become estrogenized. And that's not the goal either. So men want to keep their testosterones up. Um, so poor inadequate sleep causes low testosterone. Low testosterone causes poor sleep. So if you're struggling as a man, think of testosterone level as well. The more overweight you are, the lower your testosterone, the lower your testosterone, the fatter you become. Okay, the brain and sleep. So this is important. Those of us that are students or even not, if you want to learn and, re and retain a learning capacity, sleep is essential in the process. You need sleep after learning so that you can hit the save button. This is Matt Walker's work. Um, so that you don't forget and, and to allow for memory consolidation. You also need sleep before learning to prepare your brain for new memories. Without sleep, the memory circuits of the brain become waterlogged and can't absorb new memories. So this is what's happening. During the day, we're exposed to new information. We're learning new things. You're learning, hopefully, something today. And this is going in. And it's going into your memory centers, but into the short-term memory centers. During the night, during deep sleep or slow-wave sleep, there's little spikes of electrical activity that actually transfer that information to long-term memory. And if you're not getting deep, slow-wave sleep, that memory uncluttering and transfer is not happening. So Matt Walker and them did a study. This is looking at sleep and memory. They decided to make two categories for the study. They got a bunch of students to do an all-nighter. How many students here have done all-nighters in their studies? We've all done it. <laughs> I've done it. And um, look at the effects. Four, they put them in an MRI scanner after this period of study, and they had 40% less retention after sleep deprivation. 40% less. Because the transfer wasn't happening. Basically, when you fill up the memory, short-term memory centers during the day, it becomes like a sponge that's full of water. And during the night, you've got to empty that sponge. And if you're not reaching deep, slow-wave sleep, then you're not emptying that sponge. So, so I want to put you today, I'm not going to put you to sleep this afternoon, I'm going to try my best not to. Okay, because I'm sure Sabbath afternoon, we're all feeling sleepy. But the reality is that um, you was, what, I, what I want to put to you is you can sleep, but not sleep. And that's scary. Is you can go to bed, wake up eight hours later, and think, well, I slept the right quantity, but you haven't actually reached the right types of sleep. And your brain can be aging because of that without you realizing it because you think you're sleeping the right amount. So it's not just about how long you've slept. How do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Do you feel consistently energized? Sleep, like eating, is supposed to energize you. If you feel tired after sleeping, there's something wrong. Um, so, simple thing. Right, so they, they looked at the hippocampus. These are parts of the memory structures in the brain. And the green indicates the activity in the hippocampus after a full night's sleep. The red, with no sleep. So if you're a student and you're trying to pull an all-nighter and you're negating sleep, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I must be honest, it's not easy. Like, I get home after a full day's work, I'm supposed to study, and I'm thinking, like, where must I study because I've got to be in bed by 9 o'clock? When must I study? Oh, but then I'm like, I can get up at 4, but 
I've still got to sleep eight hours. You know, it's like 24 hours in the day. But the point is when you sleep and how you portion your 24 hours is very, very important. So what they found is um, they looked at, they did an EEG of people sleeping and they found that when people were getting to these deep, slow wave sleeps, and we can look at the architecture of sleep just now, that there are these spindles. So the EEG waveform, so EEG is an electroencephalogram. You put electrodes on the brain, and you monitor the different waveforms as the brain goes through its different phases. Um, we do the anesthesia as well to monitor the depth of anesthesia. How, how asleep is this patient? We use monitors on the brain for that. And um, when, you, when they're sleeping, when they assess these people, in de so there's, there's four phases. There's um, beta, alpha, delta, and theta. So delta is the deepest type of sleep. It's, they call it N3 stage of non-REM sleep. So sleep is divided into non-REM and REM. So your, your, your sleep architecture will show you a picture just now. The, the, the types of sleep is divided into two main types, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And the proportions of each of those are changing throughout the day. But non-REM sleep is divided into three phases. N1, N2, and N3 of different depths. And the deepest phase of sleep that you want to get to is delta wave sleep. So a lot of how you feel in the morning is determined by how much delta wave sleep you've had. Have you been getting consistently into delta wave sleep? The body goes through four or five cycles of this throughout the night. And what they did was they found that these people that got to delta wave sleep, they were exhibiting these sleep spindles. You see that little sharp thing on the top there? These, these little spindles were happening during delta wave sleep. And they were basically the spindles that were helping to transfer the memories from the short-term memory structures into long-term memory structures. So unless you get to delta wave sleep, you're not going to consolidate what you've learned in the day. That's profound. That's profound. And where they found this is important, what happens as you age? What happens as you age to your sleep quality? Does it improve? Most old elderly folks will tell you that their sleep quality has gotten worse. And many elderly folks are not getting to delta wave sleep, and there's ways of improving that. But they think this is now one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease, because Alzheimer's is principally one of the main features is poor memory. You're not getting to delta wave sleep, so you're not consolidating those memories. You're not transferring them to long-term memory structures. So they've said that there's a decreased deep sleep has been linked to early signs of Alzheimer's disease. I hope you're getting the message. You need to prioritize proper sleep. We need to make sure that we're getting deep sleep, not just a superficial sleep. So the point of that little talk was whatever affects your delta wave sleep is going to put you at risk neurocognitively. Mentally and emotionally, your brain's not going to be regenerating. You're going to be not having the kind of memory con function and consolidation that you should be having. And the number of things that are affecting delta wave sleep is growing. So one of the things that happens during delta wave sleep in the brain is this. This is a new system they discovered not so long ago called the glymphatic system. So during delta wave sleep, so if you look at the proportions of sleep throughout the night, oh, and by the way, when you go to sleep matters. Going to bed at 12 and getting up at 8 is not the same as going to bed at nine and getting up at five. And the reason that is, is there's two opposing systems which we're gonna look at. There's a homeostatic system which is trying to control your sleep, and there's a circadian clock which is controlling our sleep. And we need to act in harmony with those two if we're gonna get the best of our physiology. So we think, well, if I get eight hours, does it matter when I get it? Yes, it does. Because the epithalamus, which is where the pineal gland sits in the brain, produces certain hormones during, and it differs between summer and winter based on light levels. So between summer and winter, um, there's, an, there's a secretion of hormones from the epithalamus between nine and I think two, and in winter it's 10 to five or vice versa, yeah, 10 to three. But there's an early secretion of hormones, some of which are for memory consolidation, some of which for tissue regeneration. And if you don't align yourself with that circadian clock, you can miss out on what sleep is supposed to be doing for you at least at the, at the beginning. So when you look at sleep architecture, if you go to bed at nine o'clock, 80% um, of your sleep initially is non-REM sleep and 20% REM sleep. And each cycle between non-REM and REM lasts about 90 minutes. So you can cycle um, 
So initially, the first 90 minutes is 80% non-REM, and then 20% REM. As you go through the night, the proportion of REM sleep, which is when you dream, increases. So that by the time you get to the morning, you've got about 80% REM sleep and 20% non-REM sleep. And it's during those early phases of sleep at 9 o'clock that your body's doing some of these things. So this is called the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system is the brain's lymphatic system. And basically what's happening is the brain is using this time to actually sweep plasma across the tissue of the brain to actually clear out all the particulate matter and all the debris. And this only happens during deep delta wave sleep. Again, if we're not getting to delta sleep, we won't be restored and refreshed, and our brains are not going to be cleaning out. And this is another factor that's been linked to dementia risk. So this topic today is exceptionally important. We're facing a pandemic of sleep disruption. Um, and there are simple things we can do to optimize these different phases of sleep. So whatever can affect your delta wave sleep significantly affects brain health, memory, and dementia risk. I don't know if you can read that. Sorry, it's a bit small. If you're not getting deep quality restorative sleep, your brain is aging at a rapid rate. And far faster than it should. Disrupted deep sleep is contributing to cognitive decline, and they're using a thing called deep brain stimulation now to try and, you know, remember those sleep spindles that were sitting on top of the delta wave sleep? They're trying to artificially use deep, uh, deep brain stimulation to put electrodes on to stimulate those sleep st spindles to see if they can reverse things like dementia by replicating what should be happening in delta wave sleep. This is Matt Walker. Listen to what he says. Just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20%. Now, you would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep. Or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. Did you get that? One cup of coffee, well, coffee in the night or in the evening, decreases your delta wave sleep by 20%, which is requires at least 15 years of aging to get that kind of deficit in your delta wave sleep. <laughs> Profound. So coffee drinkers will say, and this is not to bash coffee drinkers, not at all, but coffee drinkers will say, I can drink coffee at any time of the day and I sleep fine. The question is, are you? <laughs> are you sleeping fine? Because you can sleep eight hours, but you've got a 20% less delta wave sleep. Um, Here's another graph showing the effect of caffeine on REM sleep. So REM sleep is what's happening to people that don't get REM sleep are emotionally fragile. Because REM sleep, you process what's happened in the day, you dream, you paralyze during REM sleep, your skeletal muscle is paralyzed. And a lot of emotional processing happens during this stage of the sleep cycle. So fragmented sleep is going to affect your emotional processing your mental reconstitution, your brain healing and regeneration and repair. The other, look at the effect of caffeine on time in REM sleep. No caffeine, 107 minutes. One cup, 86 minutes, down to three cups at 66 minutes. Caffeine will affect your neurophysiology, whether you like to admit it or not. Whether you feel you can sleep through it, you can, but it's having an impact. Oh, sorry. I think that's mine. Bro, any ideas? You just try the other side, yeah. It's going to sleep. It's going. <laughs> One sec. I think it's just uh, yeah. So the other thing that causes sleep fragmentation, I'm 
hope it doesn't apply here, but alcohol. People say they want their little nightcap. And alcohol decreases sleep latency, which means it decreases the time to sleep onset, but it fragments your sleep architecture. It's going to affect your sleep quality and that cycling. Benzodiazepine drugs. A lot of people go through periods of acute stress and they rely on things like midazolam, uh, not midazolam, um, oxazepam, and the benzodiazepine drugs. They, we use them in anesthesia. They push on the GABA receptor. GABA is one of the things that initiates sleep. And uh, they push on that button, but they don't replicate physiological sleep. People that are using benzodiazepines become addicted to them, but they don't get physiological sleep. Um, sleep in the body. Poor sleep quality. Look at this stat. When they, they did research on the effect of daylight saving on people's health. Daylight saving, you know overseas where they do daylight saving? When they changed to the winter or to the summer daylight saving hours, there was a 24% increase in heart attacks from one hour less sleep. And when they changed back, a 21% reduction in, in heart attacks. Sleep, sleep deprivation affects every part of your body, every part of your physiology. So poor quality sleep is increasing your cardiovascular risk. See, poor quality sleep is increasing your dementia risk, increasing your cardiovascular risk. There is good news, just hang in there. It is coming. Sleep loss in the immune system. How does sleep deprivation affect our immune systems? We've come through a terrible period with COVID. Look at this. Four hours of sleep a night, they did a study and they looked at the impact on the immune function. There was a 70% reduction in natural killer cell activity. So the natural killer cells are part of your um, immune system, and they're basically the cells that are responsible for taking out cancer cells and viruses. And four hours of sleep led to a 70% reduction in natural killer cell activity. Now think about those poor doctors and nurses <laughs> that are working night shifts, sleep deprivation. Unless you're an ophthalmologist, we, they sleep every night. <laughs> I'm jealous, as you can hear. And um, so, four hours. How many of us don't get that kind of sleep when we're working night shifts at the hospital? 70% reduction. So what does this translate to? Risk of numerous, numerous forms of cancer, nurses and doctors, bowel, prostate and breast cancer. Listen to this, the, the World Health Organization has now classified any nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. <sighs> I need to change my jobs, Emmanuel. Is it too late? <laughs> yeah, sorry, cancer causing. A carcinogen is cancer causing. So the WHO is saying, if you work night shifts, shift work, that's a probable carcinogen. That's how much the link is. And that's because of the effect on the immune system. So nurses that are doing night shifts and not compensating for it are at much higher risk of breast cancer and guys prostate cancer, bowel cancer. Um, bottom line is the shorter your sleep, the poorer the quality of your sleep, the shorter your life. It's that simple. I hope this is encouraging you to prioritize sleep. That's the idea. This is what it's about. Look at sleep in your genes. So Matt, well, this is Matt Walker's work, not my work. I'm just showing you what he's found. Um, immune function. They looked at the expression of certain genes under sleep deprivation. Immune function genes were decreased, and the genes that function that was increased were things that promote tumor promoting, inflammation, and cardiovascular disease. When you don't sleep, you become more inflamed. You lose out on those cancer protective effects. One of the mechanisms they think of the increased risk of cancer, besides what we said about the natural killer cells, is that melatonin, which is produced during, deep, during proper sleep, has anti-cancer properties. It's an antioxidant. It has, it has major healing properties. And as you age, your capacity to make melatonin also goes down for various reasons. So let's look at a little bit of sleep physiology. Um, if we understand, we can get excited, I believe. Uh, that's, I love physiology. Uh, I wish I had a pointer, but... That's a sagittal section through the brain. And if you look at that thing at the center, that's the thalamus, right? Below that actually makes sense. It's the hypothalamus, that which is below the thalamus. Okay? And that thing in the middle, this over here, this is the brain stem. That's the midbrain, pons, and medulla. 
and here's the hypothalamus and there's the thalamus. And that's the pineal gland. And that hypothalamus is where your sleep clock is. So the sleep clock is located in a region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that sits just above the optic chiasm, which is where the two optic nerves come back from the eyes and they cross. Just above that is a region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that is your body clock. That body clock is telling you what's happening in your 24-hour cycle. Um, if you want to sleep well, you have to educate your body clock to know what stage of the day you're in, and you have to act in harmony with what your, your body clock is telling you. And how does that clock work? In relation to light levels. So what comes through the retina is there's um, a, a type of pigment called um, melanopsin in the retina. Emmanuel can tell us more about that. Melanopsin and that converts the electrical signals in, um, and, and activates the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which then inhibits the, the pineal gland from making melatonin. So during the day, the reason we, one of the reasons we stay awake is because our melatonin production is suppressed by the light levels that's coming through the retina. And so that's part of setting your body clock. Now, the reason this is important is that if you know this, you can get some sunlight exposure in the morning. Because sunlight exposure without your glasses Take your glasses off because glasses are often blocking some of the wavelengths needed to actually activate this pathway. So get early morning sunshine. How many of us are getting early morning sunshine? I mean, most of us are at the office by 5, 6 o'clock under fluorescent light. Early morning sunshine sets your body clock. It's the first thing. There's two systems. There's a body clock that you need to work in harmony with, and there's... Um, a homeostatic system. As you go through the course of the day, using your brain power, hopefully, and using your muscles, you're converting ATP, your energy currency, into adenosine. And that adenosine is building up as you get tired. One of the reasons you get tired is because adenosine levels are increasing through the course of the day. That's your homeostatic clock. So just by using your brain and using your muscles, you're producing this adenosine from ATP, and that ATP, when it gets to a certain level, stimulates the area that activates sleep. Now, can you tell me where does caffeine act? Caffeine acts on adenosine. Caffeine tells your brain, so, so adenosine's like the brake of the brain. None of us are gonna take our car and go down Helderberg College Road without brakes. Hopefully not. It's gonna be a bit of a disaster. And yet we take caffeine, which is stopping the brake of your brain. It's telling the brain, listen, don't worry about that fatigue, about that signal. We're going to cope. <laughs> and one thing we need to know is that you cannot rob one area of the body without paying a price somewhere else. You will pay the price. It's designed that way. Checks and balances. So that's basic physiology there. So this is the, in that brainstem, you've got a thing called the reticular activating system, the RAS. And this is amazing. I mean, I find this amazing. If you look at how this works. So this picture, I don't think you're going to see. But basically what happens here, this is the pons, and you've got a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. This is what wakes you up in the morning. Acetylcholine activates the thalamus, which is this area here, and basically prepares the thalamus to do what it's supposed to do, which is to be a relay station to transmit information to the cortex. This part. You want to wake this part up when you wake up in the morning. So this is releasing acetylcholine, activating the thalamus, right? This hypothalamus, there's an area called, like we said, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that suprachiasmatic nucleus um, has got another area adjacent to it called the, um, the ventral lateral um, pons area, the VLPO. And basically that area is being inhibited by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it's what's basically happening is you've got a, a system that wants to arouse the cortex, and a system that wants to settle the cortex. They're working in opposition throughout the course of the 24-hour cycle. And when, when that system gets activated, you, act, you make the cortex come awake, and that's why you experience wakefulness. And people that get damaged to the system um, enter a persistent vegetative state. They can't, they can't get arousal if their reticular activating system is damaged. And then during the course of the day, uh, they, they, found another, sorry, they found another neurotransmitter called um, orexin. Orexin is this, this one that's produced by the lateral hypothalamus, and that actually stimulates 
the reticular activating system to activate the cortex. So you've got all these neurotransmitters that are acting as accelerators and brakes throughout the 24-hour cycle. If you have a deficiency in any of those neurotransmitters, if you've got, and they form neurotransmitter systems in the brain, wiring systems. Remember those wiring diagrams we used to look at? If there's deficiencies in those pathways, then you can get um, difficulties with uh, staying awake or difficulties initiating sleep. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. So that other drive I was talking about there generates a thing that's mediated called adenosine. So during the course of the day, you get tired because adenosine is building up. And if you have work pressure, you think, I'm going to beat this work pressure, I'll take some coffee. But you're paying the price. We see that, that the effect on delta wave sleep. So two systems, your circadian clock, get that in place, and make sure that you're developing a sleep drive. If you sit in your room and do nothing, if you don't use your brain, if you don't do something physical, you're not going to sleep well because you're not developing a sleep drive. So you need that homeostatic drive that's telling you you've done something during the day, and you need that circadian clock, which is in, light, in keeping with light levels, to sleep well at night. So this is the sleep architecture I was telling you about. So that's how the, the hypnogram looks through the course of a night. So if you do an EEG, those are the different stages, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. N1, N2, N3, and the proportion of REM sleep increases throughout the night as you get closer to the morning. Most of us will remember if we've woken up in, the, say, 3 o'clock in the morning, you'll remember your dreams. You'll remember what you're dreaming about. That's because the proportion of REM sleep is far higher at 3 o'clock in the morning than it is at 9 o'clock in the night. And REM sleep is largely controlled. Now, the different phases of sleep are under influence of different neurotransmitters. This is important to understand. So if you want to, so like I said, the suprachiasmatic nucleus works in conjunction with the VLPO, which is another part of the hypothalamus, but that, hypoth that VLPO uses GABA, a neurotransmitter to initiate sleep. That VLPO uh, inhibits that particular activating system using GABA. So people that are nervous and anxious that battle to sleep can sometimes have GABA problems. And taurine is one of the amino acids that helps to produce GABA. I'm not saying go out and buy bucket loads of taurine. I'm saying there are neurotransmitter precursors that one can use to assist your brain if you're battling during certain times. Um, so taurine helps with GABA production. So hormones and health. Your hormones affect your sleep quality. Fundamentally so. We looked at testosterone. Another hormone that fundamentally affects sleep quality is cortisol. Another reason people are not sleeping is because they're so stressed that they haven't switched off. Your cortisol is one of the, one of the reasons you wake up in the morning, we said, was um, acetylcholine increasing, and those, those reticular activating system neurotransmitters increasing to activate the cortex. But one of the hormones that's doing it is cortisol. So there's a thing called the cortisol awakening response. Your adrenal glands, when they sense their time based on the cycle, they start to produce an increased amount of cortisol, which actually wakes your cortex up. And they can test your adrenal function by seeing how much cortisol you can make in a certain time frame when you're waking up, to see if you're waking up, see if your, your adrenals are functioning properly. So you need cortisol. You need it high at 8 o'clock in the morning. You need it low at 11 o'clock at night. Some people, because of their lifestyles, have reversed their cortisol cycle. So when they go to bed, their cortisol's up. And they lie there like this, thinking why they can't sleep because the cortisol's up. One of the th so what I'm trying to get to is that if you're battling with sleep, you need to say, listen, you become a bit of a detective, knowing the physiology, what parts am I needing help with? Where am I vulnerable? Is my cortisol perhaps high? If your cortisol's high, you need to look at why it's high. In other words, your lifestyle. And secondly, things, there are some natural products that can bring your cortisol down at night, things like ashwagandha, there's a, there's a couple of things that can help lower cortisol at night and help you sleep better. But the reality is that you need to fix the lifestyle problem that's caused the high cortisol. So this is an important concept. Some hormones you want to keep high as you age. Some hormones you want to keep low. The ones we've looked at before that you want to keep low are insulin. You need to keep your insulin sensitivity high. You eat your insulin sensitivity high, but your insulin low itself. In other words, your body must be responsive to insulin if you want to stay healthy. But your, your sex steroids, testosterone, estrogen, those you want to keep as high as long as possible. 
So there's the cortisol awakening response. That's what should happen in the morning. You should get cortisol surge that wakes your brain up. The more depleted and burnt out you are, sometimes you don't get that cortisol surge and your cortisol regulation is reversed. So timing of sleep, we said, is important. Um, it does matter when you go to sleep. You want to act in harmony with that clock. Oh, sorry, there's another video I want to show you. Ram, do you have it there? Do you have that second one? It's just not showing where we thought it was, sorry. So timing of sleep. And now we're going to look at breathing and sleep. Okay? So just give us a moment while we find the video. It's worth watching. So now we're talking about sleep disorder breathing. Another reason you can be sleeping poorly is because of how you're breathing or not breathing at night. Watch this guy. Just, yeah. So he's got a SATS monitor on while he's going to sleep. Normal SATS is there, 95, 96 plus. Mm -hmm. Higher the SATS, the better. That's your oxygen saturation. That's measuring how much hemoglobin is saturated. Mm -hmm. Saturated by oxygen. Mm -hmm. Familiar sound to many of us. And this is a spectrum of disorders. So sleep disorder breathing is not a black and white. It's a, a line. And if you fall on the extreme right, you're in trouble. Watch his sets. And listen, the breathing stopped. What's happened now is become so relaxed in his upper airway. He's obstructed. He's not getting air in. And now he's not oxygenating. So now his sets are going down. This is obstructive sleep apnea. One of the worst case scenarios of just sleep disordered breathing. Look at his set, 70. If that happened during surgery, we'd be very worried if you've got a set of 70. 65%, 66. Time to act poor. <laughs> call, call the anesthetist. <laughs> 63. That's really bad. W watch it now. Now he hasn't breathed for the last while that you've been watching. 58. We've seen those kind of levels during COVID, but they're not conducive with health. <laughs> now he wakes up feeling like someone's choking him because the body's now sense it's hypoxic. It's not getting oxygen. So it releases these stress chemicals, the catecholamines, Wakes him up, he's got a pulse, his heart rate soars up, starts to breathe again. But sometimes you don't wake up fully like that, you don't realize that you've waked up. You're sort of fragmenting your sleep. You, that architecture that we looked at, um, sorry, where was that? Okay, I didn't put that slide in, but that's a good slide. <laughs> that's interesting. So that's obstructive sleep apnea. So the point is another reason we don't sleep well is if we're not breathing properly. So you can have all your neurochemistry in place, you can be obeying your light cycles, you can have balanced um, neurotransmitters, but if you're getting older and you're overweight and you're not toned and you're carrying too much weight in your neck, that soft tissue, when you relax and go to the deep phases of sleep, relaxes as well. And you can obstruct your own airway, literally biting off the hand that feeds you. Your own airway, you're obstructing. And so when someone's snoring, it's on that continuum. Not every snore is obstructing. Most people snore at some stage. But it's how much you're obstructing. And the problem is, as I said, that can happen. And you can not know that you've woken up. So you're fragmenting your sleep. And you wonder why you just always feel tired. But your partner can tell you you snore. But what you need to ask them if you're sleeping with a partner is, do I stop breathing? You know, what's my... What's my sleep like? Am I just snoring and annoying you? Or is there a period where I don't annoy you anymore <laughs> and I'm not breathing? And please, if I'm not breathing, just nudge me awake because, you know, this is dangerous. And what happens as a consequence of that is you get this low oxygen tension and the lungs, blood vessels have a different feature to other blood vessels. When they 
when the amount of oxygen in your lungs goes down, the pulmonary vessels constrict. That's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, HPV. And what happens with that over time is that puts strain on your heart. Your heart's got to pump to this increased resistance because the vessels have now constricted. And that can cause right heart failure. So patients with untreated, undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea can get core pulmonale or right heart failure. So this is serious. And not only that, it fragments your sleep, you mess up your brain, you affect the, the tissue regeneration, affect a whole bunch of factors. So snoring is not just funny. It can be dangerous, and it can be investigated, and it can be solved. So that's the good news. Now we've got nothing. All right, I think we nearly, that's a sign, we nearly finished. Rom, can you put that one back on, sorry. This is coming. Ah. Sorry. So that's breathing and sleep. So sleep plays a significant role in almost every system of the body. Poor sleep has been linked to mental health disorders. So when you go through that sleep disruption, if you've got that sleep disorder breathing, that catecholamine release, you're getting those massive stress hormone releases, you're getting cortisol release, because the body's under threat. It's saying, listen, I haven't got oxygen. And that stress is actually increases your likelihood of getting insulin resistance, which in turn worsens obstructive sleep apnea. And it fragments your sleep so you're not refreshed. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, pain, immunodeficiency, cardiovascular disease, we saw that in hormone imbalances. So what are some of the common sleep disruptors in closing? Stress and anxiety. See how many of these you can tick or shouldn't tick, but sometimes do. Stress and anxiety. Oh, and this is the second point. Undiagnosed or untreated mental health conditions. Depression, anxiety, these things affect sleep quality. It's no good just trying to put the sleep hygiene principles in place if you're dealing with a brain that's fundamentally not balanced to start with. This is important. So as an important precursor, you need to say, is there undiagnosed, untreated depression or anxiety that I need to treat, that I need a mental health professional to help me with that can help me sleep better? And there's a whole bunch of ways that one can do that. It doesn't just require um, medication always. Sometimes it does. Um, nutritional deficiencies, the brain has very high nutritional requirements. Uh, hormonal imbalance, as we said, lack of exercise. So one of the things that exercise does is it burns up that ATP, and in so doing will generate the adenosine that's going to activate your sleep at night. This is why sleep, one of the reasons sleep can, uh, exercise helps you sleep better. So if you're getting on, if you're getting older, and you're saying, yeah, I can't sleep, how much exercise are you doing? And there's always exercise that you can do at your age that's age appropriate. I mean, with exceptions. Of course, some people can't. But exercise is a fundamental, we were made to move. You must have seen that saying that says movement is medicine. Movement really is medicine. And uh, so think about incorporating exercise into your daily routine. And then circadian dyssynchrony. We spoke about getting early morning sunlight. That's very important. Resetting that clock. But when it comes to nighttime, what's the lighting like in your home? This is key. So the argument is that most people are experiencing circadian dyssynchrony because of the kind of lights we're exposing ourselves to. We use cell phones, we use tablets, we use computers. And I'm sure all of you know that you get the, the, the um, screen protectors now, the, what, what do you call them, the day-night shifters. So you can use those things which cut the harmful illumination that's affecting your, but it limits us, it's not, it's not perfect. When the, light, when, the night, when the sun goes down, you need to switch to lower light illumination at night. You mustn't put all these lights on. You must put them off and use lighting that's low in the, on the ground, as little lighting as possible. Switch off the screens as much as possible. And this is helping your brain to switch off for the night. If you, when you expose yourself to blue light, like in sunlight, you're telling your brain it's 8 o'clock in the morning the whole day long. So this light has a lot of blue light in it that's telling us it's morning. 
it's not morning now, it's four o'clock. And so think about the lighting in your home. Think about your lighting exposure. Resynchronize your circadian clock. So in summary, find the cause for your sleep disruption in you. I want to encourage you today, if you're struggling with sleep, there is a cause. And you can, there's, a, there's not an infinite list of causes. You can find the cause in yourself. And you must find the cause in yourself. Because it's fundamentally important to your brain health, your cardiovascular health, your overall mental and emotional health. Um, you will not be a happy, healthy person without proper sleep. To sleep well, you need good sleep pressure. So you need to build up that adenosine and serotonin. Circadian synchrony and regularity, balanced hormones, we said, and the right sleep environment. That's the other thing, sleep environment. You need a dark room. Is there an outside pavement light that shines into your bedroom window? <laughs> yeah, it's going to affect your sleep quality. Um, sometimes you need dark blackout curtains. You need to wear a mask, wear a mask. But you want total darkness to sleep properly. Anybody know the ideal temperature for sleeping? What have they found? 18 degrees, someone's been reading. 18 degrees has been found to be the best temperature for proper deep sleep. So that sounds a bit cold, but most people, I, I use the restrooms that when we get to rest at hospital sometimes, I use those rooms and you go in there, people have put the temperatures at 28 during winter. I'm thinking like, whoa, I'm not gonna sleep well in that temperature, you know, and you put the temperature down because research shows you need a little bit of, the body drops its temperature to sleep well. So open your window, get to a temperature of 18. That's your ideal temperature. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I'm saying in principle, yeah, that's, that's what you want to aim for. So how do we improve our sleep? Number one, prioritize it. How much do you prioritize sleep? Or do you still, are you still tempted to think sleep is not that important? I hope I've shown you otherwise today. Um, identify and treat underlying mental health. This is a summary. Underlying mental health conditions. What's really great is if you exercise in the morning, you're getting two things with one, two birds with one stone. You're exercising and you're getting light exposure. Go for a run without your glasses, if you have that luxury <laughs> of doing exercise in the morning. I, I dream to be one of those people one day and I plan to be, but um, exercise in the morning. Tomorrow is Sunday, you can exercise in the morning. <laughs> um, so make it a priority, uh, we said that, and then you can't fix what you don't monitor. It's actually a good idea sometimes to monitor your sleep. These sleep-wearing devices, they're not perfect, but they provide a trend. How much non-REM sleep are you getting? How much deep sleep are you getting? And you can do things to, then once you monitor it, you can improve it. You don't all have to buy a device. I'm saying they can help. And hopefully, that's how we feel afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, I hope you learned something. Um, do, are there any questions? Should we have a question and answer session, or are you just all tired, you want to go sleep? <laughs> it's quite fun. Yes. Yes. Mm. And that's what we were... Yeah, that's what we were talking about earlier, is that those are often what we call benzodiazepine medications, and they were never designed for long-term use. They were always designed for short-term use. If, if you have a major stressful life event, something that upsets you, causes a major stressor, one can use a short-term, in the worst-case scenarios, like in a real trauma. But they were never designed for long-term use. Those pills are dangerous. They shouldn't be used. And the point is, the point is you're not getting physiological sleep. So you're getting what you think is sleep, but it's a chemical-induced sleep that is not the same as sleeping naturally. The problem is many old people can't sleep, and they think that the sleeping tablet is the solution or the doctor treats it as such. But a lot of these principles are not in place. And so medication has a role, but it never has a role if you're not doing, ticking the boxes that you should be ticking. If you're not getting sunlight in the morning, if you're not getting exercise, if you're eating rubbish, if you're putting lights on late at night, if you don't prioritize sleep, if you go to bed at 12 o'clock, if you're drinking, if you're using caffeine, if you're smoking, if you eat sugar all the time and never eat a vegetable, don't know what it looks like, um, how can you then take a sleeping tablet to sleep? So, so medication must always come after doing the things that... That's why I said in the beginning, know the rules and obey the rules. 
That's, we need to start with that. And sometimes, even when we obey the rules, we still have problems because we live in a broken world. But you can't expect to get the result if you're not base, obeying the basic rules. So sleeping tablets are bad. And they should never be relied upon long term. And they should never be relied upon in the absence of doing the right things. Does anybody have any insights or questions? No. Um, so, like I said, short term, if you've had a major life... So, so short term for me would be... Sorry, we're just waiting for the mic. Um, is it better to take a sleeping pill than not sleep at all? So my answer is it depends. Um, if you've had a major life stressor that has really upset you in a major way and you, you are really in a severe anxiety state and you can't sleep for a night or two, then there's, it's no, there's no harm in trying to take something to settle you if everything else, you're doing everything else as well. But that short term is between three to five days, nothing more. And the problem is most people are using benzodiazepines long term. When I worked in Ireland, one of my jobs was to write out scripts um, for people, they would just bring an old age home script and I, would write, I had to write out benzodiazepines. And I, just, I felt so incongruent doing it because you know that it's actually damaging people more. So three to, three to five days, short term use only and in extreme circumstances where it's merited. That's the only place. If you use melatonin, which is natural, yeah. can you just stay on with that for a long time? So that's a very good question. So melatonin. So, so this is important to understand. This is why maybe tomorrow you can be excited about going to exercise in the morning in the sunshine. If you get sunshine and vitamin D, early in the morning you start to make serotonin, right? And that serotonin, this is answering your question, that serotonin is converted in the brain to melatonin at night. The same serotonin that you make during the course of the day, that system is being used to make melatonin at night. And so serotonin becomes melatonin, which is then metabolized. So any time in the body you take an end product of a production pathway, you're going to affect that production pathway. So my answer is melatonin also should only be used short term. You should try and fix the upstream problem. Why are you not making serotonin? Why are you not converting your serotonin to melatonin? Now, if you are 90 years old, which you're not, I'm just, if you're, if you're 90 years old, and your pineal gland, which makes the melatonin, is calcified, and you can't make any melatonin, and you've done everything else and you can't sleep, then melatonin can make sense. But you should always ask the question, how do I get the body to make the thing I'm trying to make? What are the conditions required? And that's what I'm trying to do in these health talks, is to say these are the, this is the environment in which the brain does what it's supposed to do. If you, if you put as many of these in place as possible, then that's your best starting point. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I wanted to find out what is, what is the impact of anxiety on sleep? Um, not necessarily sort of medically diagnosed anxiety, but like work-induced anxiety, just or work stress and sleep. emotional stress activates your stress hormones, one of which is cortisol. And cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline, so there's a part of the brain that pumps out stress hormones during stress. And they are, a lot of those are part of what's that reticular activating system that we saw. That's that part of the brain that activates and arouses the cortex because your body says, listen, I've got to fight this stress. And that system was designed by God for an acute situation. If we go into Africa and we hear a lion roar and run up the tree, that's, a, that's the system we need to, to have the adrenaline, to increase my cardiac output, to get the reserve to run up the tree, to, well, climb up the tree, have, you know, not run. And, but the problem is now the lion lives in the lounge. The lion never goes away. And so you can imagine if you get a fancy sports car, if you get a Ferrari or a McLaren F1, P1, P1, sorry, McLaren P1, 
And you constantly go down the road and you put your foot on the accelerator. You just, you just put the accelerator. That's, you never use the brake. That's what stress is. Stress is using a system that was designed to get you out of trouble quickly and using it all the time. Can you imagine what's going to happen to that Ferrari engine or the McLaren engine? It's going to burn out. And it's the same with the brain. The brain has got ex neurotransmitters or neurochemistry that accelerates and awakens. And it's got neurotransmitters and chemistry that slows and breaks. And if you want to be a healthy, balanced person, you need to make sure that you're living a lifestyle that balances the brakes and accelerators. And when you're under chronic stress, you're potentiating the accelerators, the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, the cortisol. And like we said, cortisol arouses the cortex. You're not going to sleep when you're in that stress state. So what's the solution? Sleeping tablets. No. <laughs> Sleeping tablets are not the solution. Is change. Sometimes we all have stress. Everyone has stress. You can't be a human today without having stress. But it's how you respond to it and whether or not you let the battle become internal. I've realized the worst times in my life have been where I've let stress become an internal thing, where you've let what's outside affect you internally. And um, that's the thing we need grace for and help with, is to keep the stressor outside there. And switching off our response to that stress, and then there's certain things that can help you relax, like ashwagandha and various magnesium, and these things that help the body settle down, taurine, theanine. There's things that potentiate that relaxation system. But the primary problem is not a deficiency of those things. The primary problem is how we're responding to that stress. Uh, online question here, and I hope I'm going to read it correctly. It says, what are your views on CPAP to avoid snoring? So CPAP is uh, continuous positive airway pressure. So that guy that was um, obstructing that you saw there in that sleep apnea video, what CPAP does is it doesn't treat the primary problem. It's, it uses a mask or a, a nasal cannula to blow air in at pressure to keep the airway open. So sleep apnea is caused by those upper airways collapsing. If you can increase the pressure in the airway, then you keep the airway open and the patient doesn't become hypoxic. But that's not, the patient should ideally try and lose weight, get exercise, get their hormones in balance, you know, all those things. And various, there's a whole lot of lifestyle adjuncts that can help. But CPAP is good. In, to answer the question, CPAP, if you have fully diagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, CPAP is the defined treatment for OSA. And it should be used and is life-changing. But it shouldn't be used and say, listen, I'm not going to change all the other stuff. I'm just going to rely on my CPAP. Bruce, what do you do with noise? In the old age home, the rooms are on top of each other and on this side and that side. And if somebody's talking in the passage and it's 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock and banging up doors, what do you do then? <laughs> yes, that's, I can understand that's a, a challenge. So, so that, that part of the brainstem that's activating the cortex... One of the ways that all the sensory put your eyes, your ears, all feed into that system. So one of the reasons, hopefully, your doctor doesn't fall asleep when he's treating you at 1 o'clock in the morning is because he's got lights coming into his eyes and he's got noise coming into his ears, and that's activating the reticular activating system. So that is why you're staying awake, is because you, that's activating your cortex. So um, th that's an environmental situation, <laughs> and um, I, th I think it's beyond what I can say to solve it. But the point is... You can throw them this talk and say you should be in bed by 9 o'clock. And, and also, you can wear earplugs. You can try earplugs. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> uh, Bruce, this is just about sleeping times. You mentioned um, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Is there sort of an ideal time? I know that obviously it's affected by the day-night cycle and when the sun goes down, and ideally. But, you know, is there, you know, is there an ideal time to go to bed and wake up? So the, the physiology, I, I don't know that there's an absolute answer to that, but the, the physiology indicates that earlier is better than later. And the point is, um, if, you're, if you're in harmony with your circadian clock, then those hormone release profiles are going to be happening in the earlier part of the night. 
and to get the benefit, to tap into the benefit of those releases, you need to be in bed early. So, I, I, as, as I said earlier, for me it's a constant tension. Like, I've got more to do, but the day's over. <laughs> and, but I promise you, when you go to bed early, and you get up early, you get so much more done. In that first hour, if you do it between four and five o'clock in the morning, and that sounds ludicrous, but if you do it then, you get so much more done. Um, so I would say an average, nine, nine thirty. How many of you, yes, let me, let me, okay, I don't want to shame anybody here, but, but um, let's just put it this way. How many of us here in the room are in bed before, by nine o'clock, regularly? Okay, so I haven't asked the opposite question for that reason. <laughs> so, so think about it, and I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. And, and the whole point of these talks is that you put them into practice and do the things that make a difference. Um, go to bed at 9 o'clock. Do it for a month. See how you feel. Do an experiment. An N of, we call it an N of 1. <laughs> and N equals 1 is when you're the only participant in your study. Um, so, an N of one. So, do it. Try it. And remember, it takes time to shift your cycle. If you've been going to get at midnight, so the point is, you don't want to miss out on these beneficial parts of your sleep cycle. You don't want to miss out on tissue repair, brain cleaning, brain health, um, hormonal balancing, antioxidant benefits of melatonin, anti-cancer effects of melatonin, cardiovascular benefits. You're going to miss out on all this stuff if you go to bed late and you don't prioritize it. Do, a, do an N of one for a month. See how you feel. Okay, thanks, Bruce, for that. Actually, my question is close to what you just said, and I don't know if maybe you've answered it now. Is, you've been talking about sleep deprivation. Is there ever a situation where too much sleep is bad? So let's say for whatever reason, by God's grace, you're able to go to bed early, and you don't necessarily have to wake up very early as well, and so you sleep a good amount, but then you can still actually get to do your stuff. Is there ever a time where that is too much sleep? I wish I had that problem, eh? Um, so the ans short answer is yes. They found that the sweet spot, so, so now we're talking about the amount of sleep. How much sleep do we need? Um, and like you looked at those graphs, you sleep six hours or less, your learning capacity is significantly affected. You sleep four hours, your immune system's de de depressed. So babies sleep, what, 16, 18 hours a day. But as they get older, as they get older, teenagers want to sleep three hours a day. And they get to 14, 16. But they need it just as much, they just don't acknowledge it. To answer your question, the sweet spot is between seven and nine hours a night. If you sleep less than seven and a half, seven and a half to, actually seven and a half to, to nine. If you sleep less than that, your risk increases, all cause, and it's all cause mortality. So you need sleep duration, you need sleep timing. At least seven hours, seven and a half hours a night, and you need to go to bed early. But if you start to sleep extra, extra hours, 10, 11, 12, that's also associated with negative effects. So I think on either side of that curve, they've shown that there are negative consequences. So yes, you can sleep too much. If you're doing it one morning, if you're on a holiday, that's not going to do anything to you. But if you're consistently sleeping 14 hours a day, there's a problem. There's a problem. I just have a question on regularity. Is it good to keep the same times if you can? You know, like 9 o'clock is when you go to bed, or if you go like 8 o'clock, 1 night, 9, 10, you know, if it's all over the place? Does yeah. F I'm so glad you asked that. Thanks, Don. Fundamentally important, regularity. And if you look at... If you look at Matt Walker's tips, they asked him to put a list of, of, I think, eight tips together for college students. And one of the first things is regularity. Going to go to bed at the same time every night, whether it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday, my bedtime is nine o'clock. And your brain and your body love regularity. And that means you get up at five o'clock on a Sunday morning. Because you always get up at five o'clock on a Sunday morning. Then that's fine. That's fine. It's, it, that's all right. But the point, the point is, if you're in a healthy cycle, you will wake up at 5 o'clock. I've now been waking up because of my program. I wake up at 4 o'clock, up past 4, 5 o'clock. I'm not proud of it. It's just because of what I have to do at the moment. 
But the point is, I wake up at that time on a Sabbath, I wake up at that time on a Sunday, and there's nothing I can do about it because my cycle is that. And the point is, that's what you need. You need to, your brain needs that regularity. So going to bed at the same time, regardless of night or day, what day of the week, month of the year, whatever, just do that. That's the best. sleep and some people have to have a lot of sleep is there I mean it's it's just one of those things there are there are genetic variations of course there always will be but the reality is that on averages these are the periods that are associated with the best health outcomes and they've done law you know larger study populations and with these are the these are the time frames that have they've come up with so a person might be able to get by with less sleep but in terms of the impact on their physiology, they're going to pay the price at some stage, I believe. There's just no short-circuiting what has to happen during proper sleep. We're supposed to sleep a third of our lives. <laughs> I mean, eight hours out of 24, that's a third of our lives. And the, the science shows that if you cut corners, you can do it short-term, but you will pay the price somewhere down the line. to bed early and some people like owls they just stay awake and because they feel this way the whole life is like they the whole life they're trying not to 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 do opposite because that's what they feel it's natural for them yeah and they go on like this the whole life and so instead of waking up at six or five they wake up at nine eight ten and they think that's the way they should go. And you can never convince them that you should try something else. Hmm. Look, I mean, the, the amount of people that have that luxury of that being their lifestyle, is quite few. I mean, but, but the reality is they've done in, in, um, tests on these so-called night owls, where they've taken them, people, people brag and say, listen, I go to bed at midnight, that's my thing. I believe that's an adaptation. I believe so they've taken these people, they've taken them camping where there's no external light stimulus. And I think it was within, what is it, five days? Three days. They all were asleep by seven, eight o'clock in the night. So, I mean, what does that tell you? It's, it's an adaptation. So, uh, we, the brain does what it gets used to. The brain tries to adapt to what you're forcing it to do, but that doesn't mean it's the best thing for it. So... Every night owl can become a normal person <laughs> if you take them into the right environment, I, I believe. So, yes, I mean, sorry, the question was, what must we say to the doctors who are doing shift work? Uh, if I can have that answer, I'll tell myself first. Because the reality is that somebody has to look after people that have emergencies. Um, the challenge for me, and I can say it from personal experience, is that dealing with people's behaviors that are causing those problems at that time of the night. And, and that makes it really hard, is that people are often needing medical help at night, not always, but because they've made some really bad choices. But that's all of us. We all make bad choices. But um, the reality is that you've got to try and compensate some way. You've got to try... And, and, and part of the problem, I believe, is that we're... Episodic shift work is also bad. So some, some of the nurses' sh shifts work like this. They do seven nights on, seven nights off. And there your body at least has a chance to actually get into some sort of cycle. Whereas with us, we do one night shift a week, and then you feel like death for two days after that night shift. And then you've got to try, your body's constantly trying to adapt. So I think that's also a factor, is, is whether or not you can space your night shifts together. And then what you do when you come off shift, do you try and normalize your cycle? Do you sleep straight away? Do you wear a mask? Do you exercise? Those factors can be somewhat protective in terms of that, but there's no easy answer to what you're asking because they're at risk. They're at risk. And so the balance is just trying to mitigate that risk as much as possible. With If you're doing regular night shift, make your daytime like a night in terms of your sleep. Um, it will be fine if you come home and you sleep eight hours during the day. It's, it's not exactly the same, but if you've made it your regular cycle, that's better than sleeping three hours here, four hours there. 
So that's what I'm saying. So you've got to try and create normalcy in your abnormalcy. It's not easy. Priscilla. Sorry, I just want to say and get out of that routine as fast as possible. It's part of, it's part of training, but then don't make that your lifestyle for a prolonged period of time if that's what you need to do. Find a way that it be doesn't carefully. have to be. <laughs> so Nelle, choose it <laughs> very carefully. The early bird catches the worm. Okay. And, and Bruce, I've got a neighbour right next door to me, and she goes to bed at 12 o'clock, and so really that's difficult sometimes mm. because then she doesn't consider other people that want to sleep early. You'll have to slip some melatonin into your tea at night. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, um, is there no more questions, then we can end the afternoon. Thank you for coming. Sorry. Anyone? <laughs> Let's just pray together before we close. Lord, we stand in awe of the, the minds and bodies you've given us. And forgive us, Lord, for where we've broken the laws of our constitution. I pray that, I know that you want perfect wholeness and health for your people. I know that you want to renew and restore us. So I pray that you'd help us to do the part that is ours to make the choices we need to make to prioritize these life-giving and health-giving um, practices. Help each person here to improve their health and uh, help us so that we can reflect you better because it's only when we're truly healthy that we can be optimal witnesses for you. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, everyone.